Today we gonna look at Cisco Stackwise technology. We gonna go over what is the basic idea behind Stackwise, where it is used, why it is used, and also what really happens when you link two or more up to nine of these Cisco switches together with such a so-called Stackwise cable. In addition to this, we're gonna also look at what is the ring topology which is made inside the backplane of these switches and why do you need to cross-connect these switches in a particular fashion in order to maximize the throughput between the switches because if you look most of the time you will see that you should stack them by having a cable going for, from stack port 1 to stack port 2 and then to have it daisy chained you do the same thing you go from stack port 1 to stack port 2 on the other switch as well. Welcome to Donkey Learning IT where we go over certifications, hardware, software and IT related jobs donkey style. This is part 1 of a video series what I'm doing now on Stackwise, in part one, as I mentioned, we're gonna focus on the hardware and we're gonna focus on the whys and whats. In the second part of the video, we're gonna look at software and hardware compatibility of what kind of switches can you stack. And in the third portion, we're gonna look at how is now the stack master election taking place and then I intend to do a video where we're gonna actually do some configuration by getting our hands dirty and then connecting to the switches and really making a stack and making things uh, break and make and hopefully uh, see how is now this technology really affecting the everyday life of an IT technician. Let us first tackle the question of why did Cisco even come up with this stackwise standard and what does it do for us? In order to be able to give the answer to that, one need to think in a real life network what happens. So most of the time companies grow from a small company to become a large company. They are not like an overnight sensation or something like that. So most of the time you're gonna start with a single switch somewhere, a small one, having from 24 to 48 ports depending on how many workers does the given organization have. Then as the company grows you will realize that, oh wait a minute, we need another switch here because now we have more workers and the number of ports provided by my switch is just not enough. So then you're gonna buy one more switch and for a while everyone is happy. Then of course you're gonna buy a third one, a fourth one and so forth. And now the question is what do we do? Because these switches are completely individual units, okay, I mean I can physically separate them. So it means that if my workers have to connect to a server then somehow I have to push packets from one switch to another and then what is normally done in small companies is that you're gonna buy these SFP modules then you plug in these SFP modules into these switches and then you're gonna use these SFP modules and the most of the time optical cables in order to make a trunk port between them. Now the issue is that if you use only a single one then first of all there is absolutely no redundancy so if this connection somehow is severed by something I mean the cable breaks, someone just steps on the cable, who knows I mean someone drills a hole in the wall and they, they hit your cable so this is why of course we're gonna use multiple cables I don't have so many SFP modules so I just uh, demonstrate it with uh, standard RJ45 cables because on other switches this is what you would use to 
connect two switches together. Okay, so this is then what would happen in most organizations that you would take some cables and you would just connect two switches together. Now, if we just start both of these switches, what happens is that in order to prevent so-called layer two loops, then only one of these cables would be forwarding packets per default and the other three ports would turn amber because they would be blocked by the spanning tree protocol. Now, some of you might say, well, I mean, we can easily work around that. We can just, you know, bundle these four cables together and we're going to make it into an ether channel. And now we can communicate between the two switches at four gigabit speed, which is not so bad. Okay. However, let us now think realistically. So these are 24 port switches and we already used four of the ports from both of them just to connect them together. Okay. Now let us suppose that this is a 48 port switch. Now we don't lose so many ports. However, what happens is that, look, there are a lot more ports here. Okay. Where the data can come in. And this data have to, of course, go somewhere. And if this data has to go from one switch to another, well, imagine that here you have 24 or 48 ports and you use only four of them to go to the other switch. Then this here will be clearly the weakest link in your chain, so to say in your data chain. So, it's like, you know, the data is coming in here through a very thick pipe. And then here suddenly it's, you know, it's just going through a small diameter and going to the other one. This is why this type of solution is not very, yeah, not very useful. Larger companies are working around this limitation of the trunk ports by buying these modular switches that you see here on the left side, which are also made by Cisco and uh, sold worldwide. And if you are wondering how does now such a modular switch compares to one of these smaller switches what I've just showed you previously, is, well, it's very simple. So practically one of these chassis here, what you see on the right side, is you buy this and it's very much empty. So this is here the back plane, what you see, which is zoomed in here on this figure right here. So practically you are just buying the power supplies, which then come in here in these two slots. Then here you're going to put two of these blades, which are similar to what you see here. Two of these blades, will be having the functionality of uh, taking care of the control plane and those blades uh, will be then called the so-called supervisor engines and next to the supervisor engines you're gonna buy some IO blades which then are uh, plugged into these slots here okay so you just take one of these blades and you put it inside and then you screw it in. And now you have all these front ports here, what you can use as standard IO ports, just like you would do it in a small switch. Of course, now the advantage of this larger switch is that you can have a lots, lots of ports. I mean, just look at that as an example. I mean, how many ports does that thing have? It's, it's just amazing. However, as you imagined, a big switch have a big price tag. <laughs> so this is why smaller companies instead they will buy the smaller switches and then they will stack them using these stack-wise cables what I've uh, just showed you and which we will discuss uh, in this video. One of the main advantages of having now such a modular switch besides of course this larger port count is that you have now this back plane here and the blades which are then of course responsible for the data plane so they are doing the IO 
these are then able to communicate between one each other through the backplane. And this is why you do not need here to use like, you know, trunking cables from going from one port to another right here. There is no need for that because you have here the backplane where lots of data can push through. Now when we have multiple of these smaller switches here, or what I just showed you previously, the issue is that we just do not have a nice backplane going between the switches. And this is why Cisco have made this uh, stackwise standard and these uh, proprietary st stackwise cables, because now via these stackwise cables, we can have something similar to this backplane here made between individual small smaller switches, which are then stacked together and uh, they are forming now something which is rather structurally rather similar to such a modular switch. This will cost a lot less money and for a smaller company it is a lot better investment to buy smaller switches and to stack them via the stackwise instead of make huge investments and buying these modular units. It was crystal clear that they have to come up with a better technology. And indeed, Cisco said, well, we are the market leaders, so we're gonna do something definitely better instead of, you know, having to interconnect switches through the RJ45. Why we are just not making a specialized cable and we just expand the data plane of a traditional switch and by exposing the data plane and using the specialized stackwise cables, we can make these switches to behave really similar compared to a large expandable chassis. So the advantage of these stackwise cables and the stackwise protocol in general compared to this RJ45 standard way of interconnecting switches is that now while the stackwise cables here really the backplanes are interconnected of these two switches first of all these cables provide a lot more throughput compared to the gigabit cables second thing is that also the delay and the latency is a lot smaller when you are going through these stackwise communications because there is no need to do all the encapsulation from layer 3, layer 2, put it to the phi, then go into the other switch, put it into the phi, then put it again into the ASIC and do all the de-encapsulation. That is simply because you are now directly communicating from the back plane, so from the data plane to the data plane of the other switch. When the switches are interconnected via two of these cables, then these cables can give a 36 gigabit per second two-way communication between the two switches, which is a lot, lot faster than having these ether channels here formed between the two switches and also we are not wasting any of the ports at the front to be used for these ether channels or yeah being used as uh, trunk ports between the two switches. In order to have a better understanding of what really happens when we do this stackwise as I explained in the previous teardown video, which I will link in the video description below, there is such a structural building unit inside this layer 3 switch. Namely, below this black heatsink there is an ASIC or application specific integrated circuit. Then this is a TCAM or ternary content addressable memory chip. And this small black chip here is a buffer chip where the content of your IP packets is stored for a small amount of time. And then every one of these ASICs and these structural units is then communicating with one of these files here, which is below the smaller black heatsink, 
one of these structural units here, together with the phi, is then responsible for four of the gigabit ports, and then this unit is then seven times repeated over the board as well. And then, as I've showed you also in the previous video, in between these ASICs there is a data plane going where the data is then being exchanged. Then this here is the route processor which is taking care of the control plane. Then it sets up all these ASICs. Okay. And then in the data plane the packets are flowing back and forth from one port to another. And as I showed you, finally the data plane will be expanded through these four Maxim serializer chips right here. And these traces here are nothing else but just the continuation of the data plane coming from the ASICs. And now then we're going to look how does it really now translate to a structural diagram. So in form of a diagram, then here we have again one of these ASICs or application specific integrated circuits. We have then a TCAM, a buffer chip, and then this is communicating to one of these quad files which is then going to the front of the unit where you plug in the RJ45 cables. And as I mentioned, then this is repeated seven times inside the switch. To make this figure more easy to follow, I will show only two of these structural building units right here. So main idea is that between the two A6, then there is this data plane going, which I've just uh, showed you in the previous video. And then practically this is the switch fabric when data is being inter-exchanged between the ASICs. And then one way or another, then this is the equivalent of what is the backplane in a modular switch. So then this data plane, which is shown here with these green arrows, is then going between all the seven A6 and then as I just showed you in the beginning of this video then the data plane is being expanded by four of these chips right here which are sitting next to the stackwise ports. Each of these Maxim serializer expander chips are having four channels where each one of the channels is capable of a maximum of 2.5 gigabits per second. And then of course these four channels will be combined into a single 10 gigabit per second channel later. This means then that these stackwise ports here, which are shown in purple, these are just nothing else but the prolongation of all these data plane going through the whole switch. Even though these chips are capable of 10 gigabit per second and also they are really doing 10 gigabit per second, what Cisco is doing is that they are using two of the bits for every 10 bit which is send, only 8 bit is data and then two of the bits are used for communication and synchronization between the data lines. So this means that for the 10 gigabit you get in real data throughput only 8 gigabit per one of these channels here. So when you interconnect two of the switches with a single stackwise cable only, so there is no full loop formed, then you are having a throughput of 16 gigabits per second because these two are combined. And when you have a full connection, so you use both of the stackwise cables and you connect stackwise 1 to the stackwise 2 port of the other switch, which I will just show you on a later uh, pictures, then you have a full throughput of 16 gigabit plus 16 gigabit, which is then 32 gigabit 
of maximal throughput combined. So then these switches, as I mentioned, are interconnected as these toruses here, or a 1D torus is nothing else but a ring. And this means that when you interconnect two switches back to back with the stackwise cables, two of them namely, then you will have two of these counter rotating rings here, one and the other one. And this is then comprising the stackwise connection between the data planes between one of one of the switches and the other. And we are now then having eight of these low voltage differential single ended channels for each of these stackwise ports. In this figure, then I'm showing two of these switches concentrating only on the stackwise portions. So as you see, the two switches are then being interconnected by two of these stackwise cables. So for your information, within every of these cables, so this is corresponding to one of these stackwise cables, and then this is to the second stackwise cable. Inside one of these stackwise cables, there is eight transmit pair and eight receive pair, which means that there are 16 pairs or 32 data wires inside one of these cables. This is why it's rather thick. If you count the actual pin count of the connector, you're gonna realize that there are a lot more pins than just 32. And this is because at these high speeds, what we are doing here for the communication, every second line or every second wire inside the uh, stackwise cable itself is actually just a ground wire to minimize the crosstalk between the transmit and the receive pairs. Now regarding the cable itself, I have to make a remark because I think that the cable is really not stable if you are not screwing in the two screws into the switches. In fact, the cable is so thin in, and mechanically, well, yeah, not very sturdy that I found that if you just plug them in and you just entirely rely on this connection, then you often can break these metal things here and you can really break the connector. So if you are using stackwise, then please take care that you are really screwing in to the switch, the stackwise cable. Otherwise, as I mentioned, yeah, you can really break your switch mechanically. Since these cables are rather delicate and those who work in the IT, they really know what it means to get your hands dirty. This is why often my fingernails are very, very dirty because as we know, the IT equipment is often full with different kinds of, uh, well, yeah, not very nice things. And the contacts are so small inside this connector that whenever you don't use it, please really put back this plastic or rubber boots on the connector because otherwise the connector will oxidize and also the dust will really make the connection not very stable. So yeah, take good care of these cables when you are not using them. So now here one can see more easily these two counter rotating rings. So here is one of them and then here is the second one where then data is being exchanged between the data plane of the two switches. And as I already mentioned, if I use both of these cables, then I'm having the full 32 gigabit per second throughput between the switches. And if only one of the cables is used or only one of the connections is active, then of course the data rate is uh, drops to half of it because I'm having then only this transmit and receive pairs available for the data connection between the switches. On this figure, one can nicely see what is really meant by this ring. So as I mentioned, the ASICs within a switch are interconnected inside the printed circuit board. 
So this is the data plane inside the switch. Then these chips are expanding the data plane. Then we have two of these stackwise cables. Then we repeat the same thing on the other side in the second switch. And as you see, this way we have this very nicely closed loop where we then can interconnect the two switches and then we can send data back and forth as we wish along this ring. In fact, for the stackwise and not for the stackwise plus, irrelevant of how many of these switches we have, I mean, we can have maximum nine of them. Nevertheless, when one of the switches is uh, sending a data packet, then this will get back to the very same switch and only then it will be stripped from the stack in comparison to the stackwise plus when it will be stripped whenever it hits the first switch to which it was actually meant to be sent. On this figure I'm just showing what happens if we have more than two switches. So in this particular example we have then three of these switches. Nevertheless, as you see, it's the same thing just over and over again. So we just daisy chain one switch to another via the stackwise cable, where then we go from stackwise, stackwise port one to stackwise port two. Uh, stackwise, this is a mouthful. Anyway, so we go then and we just do this over and over again. So again, stackwise one, stackwise two, and then we play the same game over and over. And as I mentioned, we can have maximum of nine switches all together in one of the stacks. And I think from the perspective of the hardware, uh, this is pretty much covering the basics of uh, what is stackwise really doing. And in the follow up uh, videos, then I will really explain how is then the master election is done within a stack what kinds of uh, things we need to take care of when we are talking about software compatibility and iOS feature compatibility. And of course, at the end of the day, we would like to see how does one configure now a stack or how does one handle it in a little bit uh, more real life scenario, not just looking at these uh, fancy figures but really getting our hands dirty and punching in some commands and screwing in some screws and plugging in some cables and, you know, make it uh, a bit more real, not just theory only. And uh, this uh, I will present in the follow-up video, so please uh, stay tuned.